Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the Cambridge Union for tonight's debate on Western military intervention. Before we start, some ground rules, especially for those of you who are slipping in from upstairs and missed our emergency debate. Uh, this is your chamber, and as a member, you are entitled to be heard. If you wish to contribute a speech in either proposition, opposition, or abstention, raise your hand when asked, which will be later. If I choose you, oh, sorry, I'm, I didn't put commas in the right places here, sorry. It, <laughs> If I choose you, <laughs> please walk over to the desk here, hand the Vice President, the ever charming Alicia, your membership card. This is so we can give you a prize if you make the best or the second best speech tonight. Today's prizes are a cocktail workshop at the Raza and a punting tour by Scudamore's, um, both worth a prize of undisclosed value. You are entitled to make an intervention during one of our guest speakers' speeches. You can do this by raising your hand and saying, point of information, or on that point, or if I may. Say this loudly and clearly because you are not mic'd up. Do not say point of order, that's something entirely different. Then, and I cannot stress this enough, wait for the microphone to get to you. Give it a second to be switched on and then make your point. It's not just an indulgent, this is so that the people watching on the live stream can hear what you say, which I'm sure will be learned and important contributions. Finally, uh, on a matter of housekeeping, our term card will be released on Monday. We apologize for the delay. Uh, that's entirely our fault. Uh, without further ado, I would like to welcome our first speaker for the proposition to the floor. Tu Min Tree is a first year student at Queen's College studying HSPS. He won this slot through open audition. Tree, the floor is yours. Well. <clears throat> well, I'd like to begin my speech by thanking the union for having given me this opportunity to speak at this historical institution on a topic that is very personal to myself. Three decades after the end of a war that has defined my country of Vietnam, one can still walk to the hospital in the city that I was born in and find children, some born without eyes, some without arms, or without legs, and without the opportunity to ever live in the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. These are the children of Agent Orange, a chemical deployed by the United States over the Vietnamese forest half a century prior. Yet it has since caused horrific genetical defects, which have been passed down through three different generations. These children are a haunting reminder of the effects that war, and in particular Western military intervention, can have on a nation and on its people. In the rest of my speech, I shall put forward a couple of reasons as to why I contend that Western military intervention has historically only aggravated the problems that it has set out to solve. Firstly, that although it frequently claims to be the neutral arbitrators of international law and the champion of human rights, the historical actions of the West have shown that in most cases this is simply a view for alternative motives, including most significantly the preservation of Western economic and political influence over the rest of the globe. Secondly, that even in the few cases where one may have a case to argue that the West had pure altruistic intentions, the complete lack of strategic planning has to do what to do after the war has only resulted in new and uglier forms of brutality. Throughout the Vietnam War, the United States, with the support from, among others, Australia and New Zealand, claimed that they were fighting on behalf of the South Vietnamese people's right to democracy, to liberty and to freedom against the aggressive totalitarian communist North Vietnamese regime. And yet it was the very same United States government that propped up a leader that carried out gruesome campaigns of terror, including the wholesale murder of those suspected of communist sympathies and many of those affiliated with the Buddhist religion. It was obvious from the onset that the United States were willing to go to any lengths, including turning a blind eye to, or sometimes carrying out themselves, mass atrocities, just so they can keep a, keep a foothold in Southeast Asia. This was, of course, shown clearly by a policy statement released by the Department of State in 1948, explaining why they were assisting the French government in recolonizing Vietnam. And they stated that their long-term objectives are to see a, 
self-governing nationalist state which would be friendly to the U.S. Meanwhile, across the Atlantic, millions of American men, many of whom know older than most people sitting in this chamber tonight, were forced to fly halfway across the globe to fight in the brutal foreign conditions of the Vietnamese forests. They not only had to fight against the communists, but also at times against the South Vietnamese farmers whom they believed would have welcomed them as liberators. And without knowing whom to trust, the average American soldier with fraught, with fear and anxiety, and many returned home with deep psychological scars. Indeed, the whole country of the United States could be said to have suffered a psychological scar of its own, one that is now referred to as the Vietnam Syndrome. Never another Vietnam, it promised itself. Never again would the country send its young men abroad to die for another meaningless war. Yet I claim that 50 years on, the West, spearheaded by the United States, are repeating its own mistakes with similar disastrous consequences. The fundamental contradictions of Western foreign policy can again be seen by their support for one of the most repressive, brutal regimes in the modern age, that of Saudi Arabia. Last year alone, the country executed a record of 184 people, some due to crimes such as homosexuality, blasphemy, and witchcraft, through means, among others, of public beheading, stoning, and crucifixion. When Qasem Soleimani was assassinated by a U.S. airstrike earlier this year, it was justified on the grounds that he was responsible for the deaths of thousands of innocent civilians. Yet can the same be said about Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, who started Operation Decisive Storm? This operation consisted of the Saudi-led coalition carpet bombing and blockading large sections of the country of Yemen, directly causing what the United Nations has deemed as a humanitarian disaster. It has led, it has led to a situation where 100,000 people have lost their lives, many of whom civilians, and pushed a further 14 million people near the brink of starvation. And yet, why does the United States, France, and Britain again and again continue to support this country and its actions? Because the truth of the matter is, is that Western military intervention has less to do with protecting human rights and democracy than it is about upholding its own dominance. And in order to carry out its aims, it is willing to support evils that rival that of the enemies it claims to destroy. But let's suppose that the intentions of the Western military interventions are pure that his actions are indeed motivated by altruism and the need to protect the lives of people in foreign countries. Perhaps some may point to the US and NATO-led military operation in Libya that eventually overthrew uh, al-Gaddafi as being driven by the will to shield innocent civilians that were, if not for the intervention, to be slaughtered under the hands of the notorious dictator. In the short period that followed Gaddafi's removal, there was an outpour of euphoria from large sections of the Libyan population relieved from the tyranny of its former leader. Democratic elections were held, and a new dawn emerged from over the horizon, or so everyone thought. As any independent observer can see today, Libya is in a state of complete ruins, with numerous factions vying for power left behind by the deceased Gaddafi, leading to the deaths of thousands of those stuck in the crossfires, and the displacements of millions of people. Similar situations can be observed across the Middle East, including countries in Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan, whereby the exit of Western military forces after the intervention is ensued by rampant sectarian violence, oftentimes with the participation of militias that receive the funding and training from the United States and its allies. Because it is only one part of the job to get rid of an undesirable government. With over overwhelming force of today's Western military faculties compared to any other country on earth, this is usually achieved with swiftness. However, it is a much more difficult task to build a government with legitimacy and power, one that can guarantee the rights of its individual citizens. Western military intervention can in some cases simply tip the balance of power to from one group of militia to another, leading to them carrying out further atrocities, or in some cases, create lawless lands where there are no states to guarantee any basic human rights. Of course, good intentions can lead to many roads, but in the case of Western military interventions, most of these roads have led millions directly to hell. Thank you.
thank you so much, Tree, for that striking speech.